Hi. Hi. Uh, good afternoon and thank you everyone for uh, coming for my talk. And, and thank you to URA and uh, organizers of this Livable Cities uh, Symposium uh, for inviting me as well. It's an honor to be here alongside uh, somebody like Alfred Peters. Um, now, my talk today uh, will, will be looking at um, urban heritage. There seems to be some feedback huh? as, as resource. Uh, and um, here we are looking at um, the way in which, actually, now, when I put the word heritage and history together alongside uh, diverse societies, I don't actually mean to say that uh, we can take uh, heritage as the equivalent of history. In fact, uh, as we shall see during the course of the presentation, this is quite far from the, the, the case, being the case. Uh, and in fact, we'll be looking at urban heritage, uh, not in terms of what has necessarily been protected, or valorized, or, or uh, given recognition, but in fact, uh, in, it includes uh, urban inheritances or legacies that have been demolished, uh, but which we can still uh, uh, find out about uh, through uh, a look at history and, and with a particular focus on the histories of diverse societies. So it's a kind of a paradoxical uh, turn. And I'm going to be presenting today uh, on six, in six sections. I will start with, uh, well, each of these sections will, will, will begin with a kind of a exhortation, if you like. Uh, and the first exhortation has to do with this, uh, that we need to recognize and act to acknowledge um, the nuances and diversity within what we already have protected and promoted, marketed even, as heritage districts with a racial tag. And uh, I would say that while this is, you know, perhaps was viewed necessary in the 1980s when this was first launched in order to be marketable, uh, I think we uh, have come at a, a, a juncture in our history where we can be, you know, a more nuanced and um, sophisticated enough to resist a monoracial framing that does not even uh, accurately reflect the true histories of the diverse societies that dwell within these uh, heritage districts. Now, we go back to the roots of this framing, racial framing. Uh, this is the Urban Rede Renewal Department, the predecessor of the Urban Redevelopment Authority, URA. So at that time in 1970, uh, before 1974, it was still a department within the HDB, Herbert, uh, Housing and Development Board. For those of you who are not from here, are not local, or you do not know about HDB, HDB is the housing and develop, uh, the, the ones who, the authority that builds um, housing, uh, public housing in Singapore. So the Public Housing Authority. So at that time, uh, the Urban Renewal Department was tasked with the rehabilitation of the old city. Uh, it had to demolish shop houses and then build HDB complexes, the ones that you see around you today, uh, a few of the public housing complexes. Uh, but it had a dual function. It also, besides that kind of urban renewal, it had another form of urban renewal job, and that was to what is called rehabilitate. This term is actually taken from the United Nations team where re rehabilitate initially meant to protect uh, a place uh, by repairs, selective repairs. Um, but there is a new uh, input uh, that the URD decided to uh, imbue upon uh, the places it seeks to rehabilitate, and that is to highlight the instant Asia image of Singapore. Uh, and that had to do with, of course, uh, tourism. Um, if you can read the text, uh, it's talking about depicting Chinese culture in this particular area, depicting a Malay, Malay culture in this area. So, in fact, if we were to zoom in, it's got to do with this. So, so, so similar treatment to highlight the instant Asia image of Singapore will also be undertaken in a typically Malay area, Indian area, etc. So, this was the, the very early, this is 1970, this is way before the 1984 and 1989 launch of the Heritage Districts. Now. You will always hear in textbooks and otherwise that this has historical basis and always you are told, oh, it's, you know, we had Jackson Plan, we had a colonial divide and rule segregation. That's entirely incorrect. If you refer only to this map, then you couldn't be more wrong. Now, this map tells you, for instance, look, it confirms it, right? I mean, this is Chinatown. And then, well, this is supposed to be Kampung Glam. It doesn't have that name in this particular map. But it's correct because it's, it's supposed to be Arabian and Islamic as you will be told. 
Uh, now, this one is ignored because it was entirely demolished. Now, there was a Chulia Kampung here, which is today the area behind Central. Yeah? But Little India is over here. So, there's something quite different, but this will still be used as the basis. Eh? This is where, if you're wondering where the heritage districts today are, that's Little India. This is what is protected as Kampung Glam. These are the districts that together make up Chinatown. Kereta Air, Telo Air, Bukit Paso, and Tanjung Paga. Okay, so that looks like this. If you, if you focus now for the, the rest of uh, the first part of my presentation, I will focus on the areas that have been gazetted as Chinatown. So if you were to just look at a, a kind of a bare map, this is a 1981 street directory, you will notice a lot of buildings. Uh, and then these are the areas that have, that have been gazetted okay, with shop houses. Now you see gaps and you see omissions, right? Now, what happens is that what we do when we racially frame is we reinforce one particular identity because this is named Chinatown. Already you would have noticed, I mean, you would have heard me, if you've seen my presentation before, you would have heard me talk about this. Um, now, nicely enough, the names for each of the districts retain the vernacular, but the whole is packaged as Chinatown, and this is reinforced by Chinatown North East Line Station, where you will be you will hear the announcement, Chinatown, New Church Way, yes? But is there a Malay one? So what would you call this in Malay? Kereta Air lah, because New Church Way. What does New Church Way mean? Bulok Khat, right? Kereta Air means precisely the same thing. But you don't hear the Malay announcement. And in fact, uh, you know, there, there, there is no, it, it's been erased. Eh? The, the name Kereta Air is otherwise erased, except for the uh, technical name of the conservation district. And you have a Chinatown Heritage Centre with a covered walkway there. Um, covered street and today if you walk past actually last night and tonight you will see a, a temporary archway saying Chinatown with bling bling lights all around it <laughs> flanked by Jame Mosque and Mariaman Temple <laughs> okay and then of course you have these other buildings so it's quite interesting and to reinforce it in 2002 we built a Buddha tooth relic temple <laughs> so actually it was invited by Singapore Tourism Board in 1997 okay and it's, it, you can read the rest online, but it's a synthetic proxy to make it more impactful as a Chinatown. Because really, if you looked at the area's history, it had a Tamil school, a Malay school, and a Chinese school. Very CMIO, eh? very interesting, isn't it? This, this is within the Gazette District. So of course, today this has been demolished. If you're familiar with the area, this is today the SIT um, shop houses that have been painted blue and white and are Hotel 81. I'm sure you know that. Eh? So that, that got demolished. Like the schools, because it's owned by the uh, state, by the col colonial government, they could demolish the schools and replace it with Singapore Improvement Trust shop houses that have today become the corner, if you remember the corner site, Hotel 81. Well, I also labelled a few other things that lie beyond, just these yellow ones. There are, there are others, but let's look at these in turn. Eh? And I also want you to remember these network of streets, Macau Street, Hong Kong Street, and so on, China Street. Here they are. So if you look at these old maps, you notice actually a lot of the developments took place north of Cross Street, not in the area that has been conserved, but north of it. So what has become of it today? It's outside the conservation zone. It's outside of it. Yeah? And what has happened in other areas around? Yeah? What has happened to the other areas around? Now, I was asking you about that. So Amoy Street, even within eh, Amoy Street, for example, and then without or outside. So this is Amoy Street here. And then this is China Street over here. Now, even within, within these areas, it's very diverse. You get shop houses owned by Arabs. The architect involved in this one is Malay. You've got Kanisa Marikan at Pearls Hill Road, North Canal Road, beside Mohammed al Sagoff, and so on. And even if you looked at Jackson Plan, which is supposed to be the holy grail of explaining why this is Chinatown, you will see what's this Kling Chapel near Chulia Kampong. Now, where is that? and Chulia Street. So one stretch of South Bridge Road was initially intended to be called Chulia Street, but it never was. Uh, because in the end, the Chulias mostly shift to what is today Chulia Street here. Yeah? Not, uh, very close to where uh, Raffles Place is. But of course, you see the legacy of this. Um, the site which is very near the site which was written as Kling Chapel, very near, not exact site, is the Sri Mariaman Temple. Yeah, so it was realized slightly differently. And then you have the Jamet Chulia. Now what this means, Jamet means a congregational mosque. That means it's the main mosque of the Chulias in Singapore. It's right there in Chinatown, or what we label as Chinatown. Um, and of course, Tian Hock King is the other you know, gem that is, uh, the architectural gem, and that's at uh, the neighboring temple. It's not Tian Hock King, 
only, so it's got another temple next to it. But this is the particular temple, is the Hokkien temple, one particular subgroup uh, that is, uh, you know, seen as the uh, one of the main rationales for calling this Chinatown. But of course, it's flanked by two other buildings, as you might know, Nagor Darga. A Darga is a, a, a Sufi shrine yeah, for a particular saint, uh, regarded as a saint. Saint is an approximation. He's, he's a, a person who is revered yeah, as a teacher and a scholar. And, and then next to it, further down on this side, if you're walking along the street like these, uh, these men are, as you notice, they're not Chinese also. If you're walking down the street, you'll see Al Abrar Mosque. Yeah? Now, now, I'm talking about all this half jokingly, but actually it's a serious matter because these are forms of interpretive violence which, as rather more nuanced people, we should try and kind of think beyond by now. You know, we're already in 2016. We've got mono ethnic enclave narratives, we've got discarded districts that we we, we will look at those, and we've got a racial habitus stereotype, which I will also look at. And worse than that, we also have, now when we have to talk about multiculturalism, it's a bit token. Uh, it's a bit, it, it, it's usually superficial and sometimes exoticizing. So it says, today there are multicultural events on the streets of Tolo Ai Conservation Area, but we include Bangra. <laughs> you know, what is Bangra got to do with the Chulias and Sri Mariaman Temple? Absolutely nothing. The Sikh, central Sikh temple was somewhere else. It's not, no longer there, it's moved up the road, but it's not the Sikhs who were there. So this is precisely what is called multicultural tokenism. You know, we say it's multicultural, but in fact it is not. Now, actually, already in the 1990s, there was a debate going on in the papers. Those of you who are old enough would know this from the papers themselves. You don't have to be reminded by this publication, but those of us who are younger, we have to read this. It's already been documented, the counter-proposals, but it was not to be. And one of the other counter-proposals that came into being in reality is this very interesting Indian Muslim Heritage Centre that was opened in 2011, so it's now five years. But it managed to uh, experience a downturn for a while that to be revamped and reopened. It's not very easy managing it on your own. So they came out with their own, it's a private initiative. They don't be fooled by SR Nathan being there and all the ministers, PAP ministers, it's got nothing to do with the state. It's their own project, but of course they invited guests of honour. Um, and uh, it's a very important site because around it are other legacies. So for example, it's got the Wakaf, uh, this particular Wakaf building, whose proceeds of which go to maintain partly this particular mosque. You also have, this is the, uh, one of the demolished uh, shop houses next to Nagor Darga. If you remember, next to Nagor Darga, there is this sudden park, right? Next to Nagor Darga, there's a park before you get to Tian Hoking. That park used to be the shop house owned by the mosque, or, or not mosque, uh, owned by the Darga. Yeah? Um, another way we racially frame and exclude, that means we discard everything else, because I used it and then you're wondering, what do we mean by discard? Is along Orchard Road. Now, when we look at Orchard Road, what do we say? We say, ah, Orchard Road, you know. Uh, Angmoor place, Orang Pute place, right? Christian, Christmas, ma? Christmas, um, you know, white, because shopping, malls, and stuff like that. And then the closest approximation is Pranakan lah, what else? Because you got Pranakan place there, the label is still there, Pranakan place. Now, that is to say that you only conserve this stretch as the, the kind of uh, place worthy of heritage status and conservation, and everything else had nothing, which couldn't be further from the truth. If you just look at houses, this is the Malay type house, single raised floor or double floor. We'll come to this later. This is the compound house, actually the same type of building, built either as two stories or single. Here's a Chinese client at Scotts Road. Here's an Arab client at Somerset Road. Here's at Killini Road for Nur Muhammad by Chinese architect We Take Mo. His Mo We Take is quite uh, uh, prolific. Uh, here. And in this one, the project was to raise the, a, a house like this to become like that. Uh. Can you see? So it's a project to raise the house to create a two-story house. So here you see an interesting example of a conversion. You have three compound shop houses for G.A. Fernandez at Killini Road, uh, three shop houses for Said Maman Al-Sagov, Orchard Road. You can begin to see an E.S. Manas, Manasa is Jewish, at Orchard Road. So it's extremely diverse. Muhammad Ali at Killini Road, this is all around Orchard. But instead what we have only is, it is only framed as Pranakan Place, and the rest has been discarded. So that's a pity because we're talking about a very diverse cosmopolitan city-state. Yeah? Um, and um, the same thing is happening elsewhere. Um, this is in the area that has been conserved as Kampung Glam. And uh, one of the confusions arises from the street names there. So you have Muscat Street. Now the reason the, the, the street was called Muscat is not very certain, but there were no, no Omani merchants there. Um, 
this we can find out from the archives. And the kind of Arab uh, Singapore, uh, uh, the Arabs in Singapore were from Yemen, yeah, from the place called Hadramaut to be precise. But oddly enough, there are no streets in Kampung Glam area that bear any name related to Hadramaut or the Yemenis, which means to say that the street names are all fictitious. And there, is, there are two references, oral archives, that seem to corroborate this. One of them claims that these street names were named after mythical, uh, not mythical, but um, named after places mentioned in the Arabian One and One Night ta Night's Tale for Bangsawan troop plays that were popular at that time. That's one of the claims. Yeah? So we've, we've created Arabian Nights Fantasy. I mean, it does look like Arabian Nights Fantasy, doesn't it? The Omani Arches. This has to do with uh, politicking. So because of the, you know, we want to, I mean, no less than having the Singapore and Oman flag there. So this is, you know, kind of un, 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 a bit not too good, not, not, not too positive, I suppose. A Basara Street has the same problem because in 1992, you will be reading in Straits Times that dome-shaped lampshades, there it, that's, that's dome-shaped lampshades. Thankfully, it's a bit subtle. Huh? Bring out Islamic flavor of the area and the planting of palm trees evoke a Middle Eastern ambiance. Now, actually, if we really asked people to live there. There was a mixed community, but largely Javanese. So the name was Kambukaji in Malay, but Kaji is the way the Javanese pronounce Haji, Haj. And Arab street next door, if you ask the Hokkien's and the Cantonese, Cantonese will pronounce it slightly differently, they will call it Chawakoi, Javanese street, which corro corroborates the Malay term for the place, Kampung Jawa. So actually, if you really ask people, they'll say it's not Arab. It's definitely not Omani. It's Hadrami, yes, there were Hadramaut, but it's not like this, you know. So, I mean, and, and it's difficult for you to imagine, but the shop houses there used to be the dwellings of Javanese. I know it's very difficult to imagine because all you learn about is shop houses were, you know, terrible places for Chinese immigrants, right? Who were coolies. What more do you know? You're, you're only the only narrative you are fed about shop houses is that. So, moving on, I think. We should ensure, this is my, uh, the, my, my third proposition, that, that ensure that narratives on architectural types, um, sorry, this is the second, that narratives on architectural types honour the history of di the diversity of the production of use and use of such buildings. So this is what I mean. If you go to HDB Hub, this is what you get. You will get 1900s genteel home from the merchant, 1950s thinking slum tenements for the poor. No, I am not kidding you, it's there in the title. And then 2000's elegant home and office for the trendy. I mean, that's marketing, right? I'm surprised HDB does it because actually they're not the ones to market the shop houses. It's URA, but never mind. Um, <laughs> maybe it's... I don't know. But anyway, this is HDB Hub's permanent public exhibition. Go and check it out before they change the display. It's still there. <laughs> Just for fun, you know? You can go. I don't know. I took this three years ago. Maybe it's gone. I, don't, I haven't been back. No, yeah. Well, anyway, this now actually shop houses are a very diverse building type. I showed you Javanese uh, family living in one along Basra Street. There are so many different examples. This is still there along Jalan Sultan. Today, this has been. Can anybody recognize this? You can't because today it looks like that, the Sultan, right, which has been redeveloped as a luxury, well, kind of luxury hotel, uh, with the adjoining shop houses and six more behind. So it's consolidated as one lot. And now, interestingly, if you trace back the, build, the, the building plans, in, 19, in 1897, it was built by Haji Mahmud, a Banjaris merchant that's from South Borneo, um, by architect Yo Hok Siang. And then it was renovated in 1901 again by Yo Hok Siang to assume the shape it is today. So this is the original shape, and then modified. So today, if you look at it, it's like that. Okay? So it, it became a townhouse. And then later, it was given over, donated, so Haji Mahmud donated it to the Riau royals who had to flee from Riau in 1911. They set up their royal printing press here. Yeah? So that's Al Ahmadiyya Press there. So if you go into the hotel lobby, you will still be able to see the plug inside the hotel lobby. And then there are other kinds of buildings like these coach house and horse stables for the Bugis merchant Haji Samsuding Dai Matara at uh, Minto Road, demolished. The street itself is demolished. So there are many different kinds of uh, building. Uh, types that are within the shop house typology. Now, I was mentioning earlier uh, this whole thing about um, Arab Kampung and um, Chulia Kampung and so on. Eh? And I mentioned compound houses. Now, I just want to bring you forward a little bit before we go back. The word compound, as it exists in English, 
Um, yes, come from the word kampung in the second sense meaning of the term. So if you go to any good in, uh, etymological dictionary, Oxford, Cambridge, you name it, uh, you will find it as a second or sometimes third meaning, depending on how complicated the etymological dictionary is. In this particular etymological dictionary, uh, the second meaning of the second sense of the word compound is the one that derives from Malay, because it's the first one which is not. That's from Latin. Yeah, the second one is where there's an elision of terms. You know, so you have it coming via Portuguese and Dutch spellings into English. And you have, you can spell it three ways, actually. Well, you can spell it with the C, like in the, um, in the uh, Jackson Plan. You can spell it with a K, with an O. And if you type that into Word document, for example, it's not identified as a mistake. It is a legitimate word. Um, and then there's compound, right? And so the, the, the implication for that is that you have, the, when you see the compound house, as I showed you earlier, physically, they are related. There's, there are projects to raise raised floor examples to fully two stories. And then if you look at old maps, you have this very interesting example of a colonial town plan using the word kampong with a C. And then if you look at another map, it says town. So Bugis Kampong is here Bugis Town. Chinese Kampong is here Chinese Town. And there's a Malay town that disappears here. Malay Town disappears. And then if you go to another map, then you will see Bugis Town. There's a Bugis village above it. Kampong Glam with the C, and then Kampong China. So the terms are interchangeable. Yeah, so that's, that's one more thing that, um, that is um, not fully understood because we only talk about shop houses. There is this particular building type in and around town, which we don't acknowledge, right? I'm sure you, you kind of like, okay, yeah, this is a new thing. It's there, actually. This is an example from Penang, though. But you've got plenty of examples in Singapore, Malacca, elsewhere. So this is in Malacca. This is in Gelang Road, some of you might know. Uh, it's a love hotel. Or rather, it, w it is today a love hotel. It didn't used to be a love hotel. So this is an example of it, when it's just a raised floor dwelling, which you can then raise higher. The kolong, as we call it, this is the undercroft. You can raise it higher to make it a two-story house like that. In this case, the undercroft pier can even be made into mock Corinthian columns, you know. Mm, but it doesn't change the type. It's still a Malay dwelling type. And then you've got hybrid examples like that. This is a compound house kind of stacked on top of a shop house. And it's still there, thankfully. Hotel, everything is Hotel 81, eh? do you notice? <laughs> We've got lots of love hotels in Singapore. Heritage of the present day. And of course, what we call black and white are very often not black and white. They are actually Malay dwellings where you paint it a darker color to protect the wood. And the rest of the wall is painted white. Now, this particular construction, I'm not going to go into the technical details. It's called the Baroti way of, uh, so when you do it this style, the uprights, the stud and rail is left exposed, so that is considered aesthetically pleasing and it's painted a different colour. If you paint it, paint it black and white, it looks, oh, you know, pseudo Tudoresque, yes? It was, it so happens, it's the same period. So in Singapore, the two coalesced and it's very nice to make it look Tudoresque. Yeah, but it actually isn't. You can paint it any other colour, you can even paint it like that and it's a temple, I mean, it's not a temple, it's the Wayang stage. It's still there. It's the oldest remaining temple wayang stage. Wayang is a Malay word, by the way. Right? Uh, on mainland Singapore, you've got another one on Pulau Ubin. Now, looking at the urban morphology of Singapore, suddenly the word compound becomes very important, and the compound houses are all there. All these black, black squares sit in compounds. They're all compound houses. They used to be a lot. Some of you might, rem might know that Beach Road, for example, is called Jichap Keng, right? The 20 houses. It's got 20 compound houses facing the sea. And of course, it's all around us. You've got, this is a, these are, these are later additions, this is a compound house. It used to be the whole of this Kampung Glam area was the compound of the Istana, Istana Kampung Glam. But gradually it became, because of land pressure, sold off to be developed as shop houses. Of course, this is another compound house. If you recall this particular image, sorry, I'm gonna, this one used to have this as the compound of the house. And then because of land pressure, this was sold off, this was sold off, this was sold off, and they're all subdivided into shop houses. So you've got this kind of a morphological history. Gradually, all of this, these, as you know, are no longer compound houses for sure. Now, this at Waterloo Street, we'll look at an interesting example later. And actually, today at um, here, this is Golden Landmark. Some of you might uh, be familiar with this more. This is the site of Golden Landmark. It used to have a compound house as well. This was the president of the Singapore Malay Women's Federation. Yeah, so these are all examples of heritage that are no longer there, and um, it's possible, however, for us to retrace it um, for, in terms of the, the kinds of architectural as well as social 
cultural diversity that once existed. Um, but architecture has a way of uh, be, having such a strong physical presence that whether it is there or not, or whether it has changed its architectural character can determine uh, the way we perceive the place's history. Uh, if, if that sounds very convoluted and confusing, just remember that um, you had those Saracenic, you have those uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, intended uh, lampshades and uh, palm trees planted on the street leading up to Sultan Mosque, inspired by this building. But in fact, the original building it replaced was this form, yeah, which is part of the Southeast Asian form of the mosque, yeah, uh, with all these kinds of accoutrements. Yeah. So if you look at it in its original form, you wouldn't have seen this as an Arab... It wouldn't seem like such an Arabian-like district. Yes, but today, because of it, it, it gives that kind of presence. In fact, if you, if you look at this, this is not... You, you have to look at the trustees' board as well. If you look at the trustees' board, Sultan Mosque acknowledges the diversity of the community in Kampung Glam. Bugis, Javanese, Malay, North Indian, South Indian and Arab. Two each, to form 12. It's a committee of 12. And in fact, it was a shared form. So you can see these kinds of uh, ornaments on a tiered roof structure. Um, and then the whole building is um, surrounded by parapets and miniature minarets in the manner of the Chulia Mosque we saw earlier. Remember Nagor Darga? So this is like having Nagor Darga with the top, uh, as a, sorry, as, as a uh, uh, Malayo-Javanese mosque. Yeah? Today it's been rebuilt like that. So again, that reinforces this. So architecture has a, so it's a kind of um, mixed bag. Yeah? So architecture can sometimes uh, mislead uh, us unless we know the history behind its transformation. Now, uh, sorry, this is supposed to be three. Now, the next point I want to bring up has to do with the fact that we, we should, uh, um, I've kind of mentioned this, we should acknowledge place names as another signifier of diversity. I mentioned places that have been discarded. So the places that, the, the zones that are colored, uh, well, I guess this is a kind of purple, are the conservation areas. And the areas that are shaded red are the ones between them that have been, that we, 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 we don't talk about. So there are all these names. I know you, you, some of you who have not seen this before might be thinking, I'm making all this up. Kampung Bengkulu, Kampung Hailam, Kampung Serani, Kampung Dobi, you sure or not? Where you get all these names from? Kampung Susu? <laughs> this guy must be kidding me. No, I'm not. Cross Street was Palkadai Saraku in Tamil. My Tamil is not very good. Cross Street is also Kaling Akoi, Kaling Akoi, Kaling. Yeah? That means uh, Chulia or Kling Street. Yeah? Chin Chiu Street is Arampile Sadaku, Arampile's Road. Who is Arampile? Cross Street, as I mentioned, so this is the same, just a different uh, dialect pronunciation. So you have, for, now, even if, if you go to Chin Chiu Street, you also get, for example, a shop house built, rebuilt as a Chinese temple. These are things that have been lost, and then the same street is called Arampile Sadaku. So you know that along the same street, yeah, you've got all of this kind of micro-diversity. When I interviewed this man, he told us that uh, the first Malay doctor in Singapore, who is in fact Bugis, uh, Dr. Abdul Samad Hajipaga, has a dispensary at uh, 186 South Bridge Road, but as far as everybody was concerned, that was considered cross street. So it's near cross street, so everybody looked at it as a cross street area. And he remembers that most of the people who visited uh, uh, spoke Teochew, yeah, the dispensary. Um, and then if you look at Hong Kong Street, there's D'Souza, a chitty owner. So the street name does not necessarily tell you the community that lived there. Just like Moscat Street did not have Omani people, Hong Kong Street does not necessarily have Hong Kongers. You have D'Souza and Sons building for Sherda. You have a chitty, uh, which is a uh, Tamil Pranakan, yeah? at Hong Kong Street. Sharifah Shaika, that's Arabic, Sharifah Shaika, and another Arab, um, Tamil Muslim, Tamil Muslim, these are at Upper Macau and Macau Street, Upper Macau, Solomon and Salomon, I'm wondering whether they are the same person, yeah. Aljunid at China Street. So it's actually very diverse. Now, I come back to this, we today have not just Buddha Tooth Relic Temple, but the Chinatown Visitor Center on top of Chinatown Heritage Center. Everything proclaims Chinatown or some version of Chineseness, in this case, reinterpreted as Buddhism, although that's not necessarily Chinese, right? But anyway, now I highlighted these yellow streets. What do you think I'm highlighting it for? The place is called Kreta Ayer. There's Kreta Ayer Street here, isn't it? 
Now, all of these yellow streets, believe it or not, had shop houses owned by Bugis and Malay persons. Yeah. So in 1929, Haji Ambo Dalit de sold these properties to another person who is also Bugis. And then some sold to Arabs. Yeah. Here's the Bugis sold to a Chinese, and so on. So if you look at the transactional histories, hmm, those are the yellow streets. I'm talking about the yellow streets. That's Chinatown, isn't it? If you go there today, everything about it seems Chinese. But not too long ago, this is 1926, 1929, 1922, it was not necessarily the case. So what are we dealing with here? And I mentioned the shared name, so here, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't bluff you, you know. Even the Chinese called it Kampong Mangkulu. That's to transliterate Kampong Bangkulan. And the Bangkulans are in Singapore because Raffles was in charge of Bangkulan before he arrived in Singapore. Remember Bangkulan, the place that she didn't like, had no potential? on the, other, the wrong side of Sumatra, facing the Indian Ocean. Uh, of course, wrong in inverted commas. Huh? The Bengkulan community has a cemetery. It's within Istana grounds. The fate of it is unknown. It's neither gazetted nor anything. There's a, there's a cemetery, it's the historic cemetery of the Bengkulan. They were among the earliest settlers, first generation who came with raffles. Huh? So their cemetery is within Istana grounds. The, the Istana, not Istana Kampung Lam, but um, the former governor's residence, the colonial one. And then, of course, Kampung Malaka, the series of streets are all called Kampung Malaka or Kampung Malaka. That's just a transliteration. Yeah. So, Canal Road is called Kang, the stream or the river. Yeah. Hong Lim Key is called Kampung Malaka's Sea Beach, High Key, the high that you get in Shanghai. And Buffalo Road was called Kampung Kerbau, Kampung Kalapu. Yeah, so these are shared names. I mentioned a few others, right? Pal Kam um, Kampung Susu, you've already seen. Um, Water Kampung and so on. Yeah? And of course, Kampung Surani. I mentioned Chawakoi earlier. Kampung Surani sometimes is even this precise, you know. In, ja in Malay, Little Cross Street is no longer there. It's now called Baghdad Street. Okay, so Kampung Glam had its own Little Cross Street. And it had a street called Kampung Tembaga in Malay. Tembaga refers to the coppersmiths, Javanese coppersmiths. And in Hokkien, it was actually called the Javanese Copper Streets Street. So these are shared names. And you can find them on maps too. Kampung Glam, Kampung Rocho is the other side that has been completely demolished beyond Jalan Sultan. Kampung Bengkulu is written there. Other maps show you now. The ones in square brackets are not shown, but I'm showing you the location. Okay, they're not written on the map, but the ones that are written on the map don't have the square bracket. So Kampung Saigon is written here. Kampung Melaka is not written, but it's located there. Kampung Glam is written stretched across. There's a Kampung Java over there, and Kampung Bengkulan is here, Kampung Kapur, and so on. Yeah, so these are the place names. Now, Kampung Surani looks like this. The power of framing is such that, well, because we don't talk about it um, as a heritage district, it's, um, you know, it doesn't register in your consciousness. But it's there. I mean, the, the church is there. Yeah? The Episcopal offices are there. Um, the schools affiliated with the church are still there. The buildings are there. Now it's Design Singapore, right? But the buildings are there. Um, I mentioned um, to, uh, Waterloo Street. So this is the, the intersection between Kampung Mukulu and Kampung Sarani. So it's a mixed bag, but it's also got a synagogue. So it's got the coexistence of the compound houses. There are, that's another compound house. There are altogether five compound houses. If you recall that map with all the black squares and dots I mentioned, a morphological history. So this area used to have a lot of compound houses, some of which have survived. Yeah. Um, here's actually another compound house next to a... Now, this is within the Kampung Bengkulu area. The owner of this particular shop house, if we were to look at the architecture, look, it's actually got Palladian windows. It's got a Chippendale broken pediment and so on. Yeah. But the owner is Encik Manap. Yeah. Architect R.C. Norin. So, and so on. So, actually, it... What, what we are looking at here is that these street names don't mean nothing. They don't mean nothing. Because if you, if you look at the history of buildings there, it's corroborated. Yeah? And, and people share these names across languages. And I think that's pretty important when we talk about um, architectural and urban heritage. Yeah? Even if the buildings are no longer there. Um, and I mentioned also places that are outside. Now, you notice, if before I put the yellow, the two places of concentration of development are here and here. So the conservation districts fall outside of those historic zones. Huh? Yeah. Another example. So, now, um, I will focus on a few areas right now. Um, 
the areas that fall outside the blue zones, which are the conservation zones. So within the Chinese community, you can see this is the Teochew Temple. This is the combined uh, uh, Cantonese and Hakka Temple, Kuk Tak Chi. And then this is the Hokkien Temple. Uh, you have a Hakka Temple right here with, within an area that on maps are written as Malay Town, strangely enough. And then you have Kampung Malaka up here. Now these are areas that fall outside of the conservation zones. Yeah. Um, you look at all the maps, they will tell you this is Kampung Malaka. Um, this is Kling Street. Yeah. And we will look at these two as well. High Street as well as the area in front of what is today ACM, Asian Civilizations Museum. I mentioned Kling Street over here. Yeah. So obviously, it's, it, it has a name like that um, for, for a reason. And if you were to look at these old photographs, you notice the names, eh? Latif, this is Mohideen, and so on, right? Muhammad Ibrahim and company. There are quite a number of them. So the area around uh, Ruffles Place, north of what was written as Chinatown in the old maps, is diverse. And today, this mosque has gone underground, right? Literally, because it's today underneath this octagon, the octagonal tower of uh, OUB, uh, sorry, UOB. Yeah? So if you notice that this mosque is actually there along Market Street Junction with Chulia Street. Yeah? So actually this kind of diversity is uh, sometimes even in the most unexpected places. Mm. And uh, if you look at the maps here, for example, the Kampung Malaka North and South, you've got, sorry, you've got the names written there. So there's Kampung North Kampung Malaka, uh, sorry, South Kampung Malaka and North Kampung Malaka on this map. Yeah, this is an 1893 map, Kampung Pukat and so on. Yeah. Um, now, within the Kampung Malaka area, the only surviving building is the mosque. Yeah. It's the only surviving building, but it's completely surrounded by MOM building. So, what I showed you here, now that's the mosque, right there. And this is Omar Road and Mosque Square. So, Mosque Square leads directly to the mosque. There's no other road like that with a name like this, but it, it's, it's... So those shop houses there were all demolished so the MOM building can wrap around it. Ministry of Manpower, that's Ministry of Manpower there being built in this particular case, that's what it looks like. So it's, it's now nicely protected, right, by Ministry of Manpower. Now the kind of shop houses that used to exist around it at Moss Square and uh, Omar Road uh, as such, eh, owned by all these persons who are obviously part of the community that was Kampung Malaka. So, the word kampung here really does not mean village at all. It means an urban ward. I think I didn't emphasize this enough. Huh? So these are the kinds of shop houses and the persons who owned it at these streets. Uh, Muhammad Arab, uh, Muhammad Arab, I think it's the same person. It's just written wrongly twice. And High Street, again, you, you, today, of course, High Street only has the collection of uh, malls that have a largely North Indian uh, uh, shop concentration. And that's a very historic concentration. Of course, it's not exclusively North Indian. There was, in fact, uh, one Arab, uh, uh, this particularly prominent uh, building. If you notice, it has this interesting dome and crescent star next to a European-style um, pediment. Rather interesting. Of course, the building is no longer there. But you also have the North Indian traders. These are, this is quite a well-known company if you look at the old records. They were there. And another very important uh, aspect of Singapore urban heritage that is no longer there, but it, you can find it in all the old maps, is this. Now, I don't know whether you can see what this is, but this is Fullerton is over here. This is Boat Key. ACM would be here. This is the Padang. Yeah? So our new art gallery is here, right? And then the, the Parliament House, that, that, that's, that's Elgin Bridge, right here. So here it's written as Singapore Town and there is a road to the palace of the Temenggong. And I think the way we understand the role of the Orang Laut in Singapore's early history is quite off the mark. If you were to really listen to people who live in the 1800s and 1920s, they're talking about the role that Orang, I'm not going to go through everything, but the role that the Orang Laut played in the mercantile uh, activities of Singapore River uh, is not to be trivialized. They, they, they played a role and their shipping also was praised. So they were there and of course they had to be moved. Yeah, the, whole, the whole group was moved, right? So most of them either went to Tolok Blanga or Tanjung Ru. Yeah? But they were there nonetheless. So that's something that we don't acknowledge 
uh, in today's uh, narrative of this part of, of Singapore. Uh, now, lastly, if you look at the discarded districts to the south, all of this is completely out of our uh, radar, right? Of course, there's already diversity up here. And then what more down here? Now, you notice it's quite interesting. You've got the Pasi Burial Ground. You've got uh, this mosque right here. You've got the old Joss House, which is today the Hakka Temple, one of perhaps the oldest. And if you look at this particular map, it's even more intriguing. It says there's a Malay town down here. And then this particular Butte map tells us there's a, the Sultan's village down here as well. So something is going on at the base here. I've rotated this map. So south of Tolok Ai Street is this Malay town in the old maps. Yeah? And if you look at Percy Carpenter's 1856 painting, it corroborates what the maps tell us. This is from Mount Wallach. Percy Carpenter informs us this is Singapore from Mount Wallach at sunrise in 1856. Now, Mount Wallach is this particular. So these, the people you saw on the, in the painting are looking up north here, right, towards Kampung Glam. Yeah. And then south of it is the, in this area is the, the area that is labelled as Malay Town. Yeah. This particular image. And of course, you still have these buildings there. You have Karamat Habib No, you have Haji Muhammad Salimos, and you have a Hakka temple that was rebuilt in 1844. None of these three buildings are protected. But if anything, they show a very interesting multi-ethnic diversity beyond the areas that have been gathered as uh, conservation districts. Yeah. I mean, look, they're all over 100 years old now, yeah, but they're still not gazetted. In fact, if you read the papers and noticed, these were the ones that have fortunately been saved so far from being demolished because of the Prince Edward line. So again, you know, there's, there's, if there's a community, there will be some architectural evidence for it. So um, if you look at some of the old drawings, uh, you will find these. Uh, the persons behind some of the construction um, of the buildings. This person is the uh, son of the person who endowed this mosque. So the mosque and the mausoleum are two separate buildings. And if you put that in context, we were just talking about the mosque, there's a mosque, the mausoleum on the hilltop, and the Chinese temple, which is right here. But there's also a Parsi bearing gown, Parsi lodge, which is gone, and then the old Fort Palmer. And if you look at it in relation to the streets today, um, there, were, there is still this Angor Street where, if you look at the historical records, there used to be a Malay press there. So the kind of racial framing that we have would never have... Um, talked about or even come close to recognizing this kind of diversity in an area that's not even part of the conservation district. And I think it's to our loss. Um, I want to now quickly go through areas that have been completely... So at least we, will, we are looking at places which are not acknowledged in, in this section, but the buildings are still there. I'm going to now look at areas where the buildings themselves have been completely demolished. Completely demolished. So around um, Kampung Glam district, the areas, and, and that's Little India, these are the areas that have been demolished. All the zones in red. She quite a fair extensive bit. Now within this section is this mosque, which in 1995, when, 1995, not 1985 or 1975, but 1995 when it was demolished was already over 100 years old. This is after we gazetted, we gazetted heritage districts in 1989. But seven years later, this was demolished. It was over 100 years old over a hundred years old. So it's there today, if you're wondering where it is. Yeah. So during the war, the top roof got damaged, so it was replaced like that. But the four principal columns are still, were still there, according to the people I interviewed from the mall. So it could re easily have been replaced, the damage, I mean. Yeah? So you might recognize this as Haji Lane, right? Now all the hipsters are abuzz about this, right? And then you have Bali Lane. Well, what, guess what? There used to be beyond Bali Lane, Shaikh Madrasa Lane, Clyde Street and Jeddah Street. Jeddah Street, like Mosque Square, was a street that led from the waterfront. Beach Road would have been here, yeah, directly to the mosque entrance. Okay, this is the, the street. So it was a street that led directly. And it's called Jeddah Mosque because uh, of the shipping to Jeddah for the pilgrimage. Hmm. And another building that was demolished, this one in 2004, is Pondok Jawa. I think this is something that is still hanging in the balance. That's... Um, it's supposed to be rebuilt at some point, we don't know when, but there you go. It's an, a, another important community institution in the area. I put this photo there because Sate Club is one of the institutions uh, for food in Singapore and it actually has its origins in this building. 
it actually has origins in this building because the people who sold satay at the itinerant hawkers along Beach Road, which was where all the theatres are, were, rather, were, uh, had their base of operations in this building. This is, well, if you're wondering where it is, this is Sungai Road Market, so that's the mosque. Now, the Bawianese are a small group in Singapore, and their mosque uh, was also demolished in um, 1995. 1995. Yeah. By the time it was demolished, uh, it's less than 100 years old if you're using that as the yardstick. So, but come on. Yeah. So this particular building is something now. I'm putting this up for our consideration in terms of what we can do moving ahead yeah, or for places that have been completely demolished. Now, another area that has been completely demolished is this, as Precinct N1. If you look at this old map, this was a very heavily developed street network in old Singapore. Yeah. This is the first complete survey map of Singapore done by G.D. Coleman in 1829 and drawn out as a map in 1836. And this area is demolished in its entirety. It originally was the relocated settlement for the Bugis. So because the proposed European town was to take over from where the Bugis were staying, the Bugis had already cleared this land, built their town there, and guess what? The Europeans said, no, no, we need it. So you've got to move. So they moved. After they moved, you can see all the street networks. In the whole of Singapore town, in this first survey map, this is the only net area with a street network in Malay. All the street names are in Malay. So if you're talking about the urban history of the Malay community, the Malay trading community, or to be precise, the Bugis as well, eh, this is the area which is most important. But it's been entirely demolished except for one building. Except for one building, Hajar Fatima Mosque. Now, in case you were wondering you know, what the Bugis... Uh, importance to Singapore is in 1833, that's very early after 1819, a trilingual dictionary was published between the English, Bugis and Malay languages in Singapore. Very early and this is Bugis script. Yeah. So building materials being one of the categories. So obviously it had a role in the economy of early Singapore to warrant the publication of this trilingual dictionary. Yeah. And of course to warrant the fact that they were relocated rather than just pushed away from Singapore altogether. Right? But this is what happened when the area was demolished. So that's Hajar Fatima Mosque right there. This is a partial demolition. Now, uh, we're talk talking about this area, um, the, the streets. Now, um, when, when, when we look at it from an aerial view, this is the conserve district, and this is the area that has been completely demolished. Yeah? And this is the largest demolition zone in early Singapore, the largest. So in fact, nothing now today commemorates the importance of this zone. I want you to remember this is Rocho River. Okay, this is Rocho River. ICA building is here because we're going we're gonna to come back to this particular um, uh, river. Now, you look at this map. If you look at this map, there are two things that... Uh, sorry, I'm going to zoom forward because we have no time. Um, these are some of the shop houses that were found there that is completely demolished. Now, this is the river I was talking about. So, this is before the river was straightened out. Yeah? But you notice in this map, there's, a word new, there's the words new cut and old cause. Yes? Okay. And then we were looking at the river from here. The, this whole area has been demolished. In the fo aerial photograph, we saw the river flowing this way. You notice that in the old cause to the new cause, it has been quite straightened out except for this kink. Now, later on, there was a project to straighten this. So this was done by the British at the request of the Bugis merchants in the 1820s. Now this was done much later. And it was done by this particular Bugis merchant, Haji Ambo Dain Pasandre, in 1906. Where is this? This is right behind, and this is the tomb of the man who did that, a civic project. Okay? Urban heritage, if there ever was one of a dramatic fashion that is completely ignored today. That's actually here. That straightening out, yeah, from here to that, is just behind your ICA building, here. Right here, where there's a footbridge. Now, there is a Rocho River ABC Active Beautiful Clean Project. But it ignores completely the historical significance of Rocho River. Yeah, as the other port town of Singapore is completely ignored. The fact that this is the old cemetery of the port town, uh, the fact that there used to be a school here, um, a very important one that appears on our $2 notes. It's all not uh, acknowledged. Eh? 
The importance of this new cut to Singapore's navigation can be seen in this map. If you look at this, this is a navigational chart of 1828, published 1837. If you zoom in, yeah, it actually states new cut, and that's Lavender Street and Serangoon Road. Eh? So it actually states in such a large scale map, it actually bothers to state the new cut that you see in the older map in this new water cut Rocho Canal. Yeah? And of course, like I mentioned, this kink is done by a, was, was, a, was straightened out by a particular Bugis merchant. And that, that same merchant dying Pasandre, whose tomb you saw earlier at Jalan Kubo, built other timber depots along Rocho Canal. So these are some of his projects. Um, one more thing is that if you look at the old maps, you notice this particular street. The street is still there today. If you go to the street, you will see that the sign, the street sign says Kampung Bugis and nothing else. Now that's the other side of this Kampung Bugis. Yeah, this is the Bugis Kampung relocation. There's another one. Now, if you notice these these uh, drawings, there are all these houses that are built over the water. This is an 1838 map. So this is what the houses look like. Okay, so they've got these kinds of sailing vessels, huh? the Palari, which appeared in our $10 note in the past, and then this particular Lete Lete, which is a, another kind of ship. Yeah? Now, um, these kinds of houses are depicted like that. In the URA Gallery, it's actually a, not a fishing village scene, you know. It's actually not, I'm very dismayed. So this is, I mean, to emphasize that it's a fishing village, you've got to have fish. Right? So actually the trading vessels were removed. Right? You, re you obscure the trading vessel and then you remove the pala So it's now a fishing village. <laughs> to add insult to injury, the only trading port mentioned has to show a Chinese ship, right? Because the natives don't trade, they are just fishermen. Am I right? This is at URA, by the way. URA Gallery. <laughs> This, these were Bugis vessels. Why show a Chinese junk? Yeah. They were Bugis vessels. This is 1975. Not that long ago. And this is, uh, uh, come on, it's not too long ago that we had $10 notes with the Bugis Palari on them. And then in our maps, we have the Golekan, the other ship type. It's not the Lete Lete, there's another one, so there are at least three different types. These are from Madura. These are Bugis silks being traded on some of these Maduris uh, Golekan. Now, I mentioned the street just now, right? The street that is today still called. Now, this is the first survey map I mentioned by, uh, by already done in 1829, and the street is still there. There. I mean, it, okay, the survey map not very accurate. Huh? It looks like it, it twisted around, but it's still there. The street is still there. Now, the plans that were put in place in the 1990s for Kampung Bugis Development Guide Plan uh, ignored the shape of the street. So it's one of those things where urban heritage, in this case, lives on. In, the case, in this case, because of the street name as well as the shape of the street. Yeah, it's that um, kind of a tenuous link to the past. The demolished area is over here, just to give it the context, and the straightened part of the river, yes, if you remember, behind ICA building is right here. Now over here is the old tombs of Malayan princes, which is the uh, Jalan Kubo, and then here is this, this particular school. Now, um, Jalan Kubo looks like this, yeah? And the school looks like that. It's in uh, this is the building, not the rest, but this one. Yeah. Kotaraja School has been demolished as well in 1995. And in fact, right now where we are, right this very spot next to MND is URA Center used to be Umapulava Tamil High School. And you notice the street next to us is called Kadayanalur Street. This is all supposed to be Chinatown, right? <laughs> Am I, you know, Kadayanalur Street? Uh, how come there is, I mean, of course, Jamai Chulia and Sri Mariaman Temple is there. Now, I remember, if you recall, Sago Street, Banda Street, this used to be owned by Bugis merchants, yes? Who sold it to other Bugis merchants and Chinese merchants and so on. Now, you have Muhammad Ali Lane, Rama Street and so on. Now, Umapulava Street was acquired in 1975. So, it's, we are we're actually standing on its site, right there. Yeah. So, this was the school that used to be here. So actually, it's urban heritage demolished very recently, 1975, not too long ago. Now, this is the last part. Uh, if we're talking about all this, it sounds like I'm always talking about recovering something that is lost. Okay, what is already still there? Um, if you talk about modernist architectural heritage, there's plenty in Singapore built in the 70s. In fact, ironically, many of the uh, heritage that I've shown you uh, in this section 
not the previous one, but in this section, have been demolished precisely to build these kinds of modernist complexes. Now, the modernist complexes today are important as tangible architectural heritage in themselves, but they are also containers for socio-economic diversity. You can name a, a few. I mean, you can talk about uh, Peninsula Plaza, which has a Burmese community today. Um, you can talk about um, even um, the Thai, Thai community that is in um, Golden Mile Complex, but I want to bring your attention to Geelong Sarai, because Geelong Sarai is one place that you and I would probably say, yeah, it's kind of a Malay area, right? Something like that. But all the buildings there are modernist. The only thing that makes it culturally important has to do with the shops. In other words, the buildings contain something. That something is fragile, because in the real estate com competition that is going on today, all of this can just easily go. And the current plans keep changing the buildings that are there over and over and over and over and over again. In fact, sometimes it goes back and forth. In this 1994 plan, Tanjung Katong Complex will no longer be there. But in the 2012 plan, Tanjung Katong Complex reappears. It seems that this is quite an arbitrary decision whether or not it needs to remain. Yeah? Because when you listen to the, the, the planners at, at this stage, they will say, nah, we cannot keep. And I hear say, can keep. Nah. <laughs> You know, so it's not really a kind of cast in stone. Okay, the old, the old blocks have been demolished to make way for these new blocks and new market. And then this particular Malay village scheme has been demolished, future civic centre. And this hangs in the balance. Now, all of these buildings collectively form Gelang Sarai. In other words, they are actually modernist heritage that, that are containers for something intangible. And that's where I think, when we talk about urban heritage, we might be, there might be a blind spot because we're only thinking about heritage buildings. So what about places like Gelang Sarai? It's no use building these kinds of, it's kind of tokenism, you know? You make it look Malay, it's not like that. It's got, uh, now there's a new design, which I'm not showing, right? The, the, it's supposed to look Malay-esque, am I right? <laughs> so at least, you know, we pander to the, you know, all these Malays, they want this, one that, right? So we give it to them. <laughs> okay, make it look Malay, they're happy, good. But that's not the point. The point is that it is Malay because of the shops and the retail culture. Yeah, so it, in this sense, urban heritage requires us to think about economic sustainability rather than just, uh, rather than just uh, talking about physical form. Thank you. <laughs>